All right, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about trying to put into a historical context where we've been and, and where I think one of the major places where we need to go in terms of the science and practice of, of urban forestry. And, and I have here uh, Dexter Locke, who's been working with me a lot on this, but I, I should acknowledge other people who contributed significantly, such as Charlotte O'Neill Dunn, uh, Mike Galvin with Save a Tree, and, and Dr. Michelle Romolini. I really like seeing Dr. Michelle Romolini. Uh, Michelle got her doctorate last December. A lot of us are very excited about that. Um, she did a great job. Okay. So, um, in terms of an overview, what I'd like to do is, is talk about urban tree benefits and services. That's what a lot of our conversation has focused on over the past day and a half. Then this idea of urban tree canopy assessments and prioritization. Jarlath introduced that idea uh, a little bit earlier. And then I'd like to, to advance the idea that we have a new, new forest landowner. And what does that mean? What are the implications of that in terms of our urban forestry practices? And then to conclude and think about how do we start to bring this all together? Past day and a half, we've been thinking a lot about services and benefits. And I would argue since the mid-70s up until now, and we continue to focus on it, most of our urban forest research has focused on uh, services and benefits. And people like Dave Nowak, uh, Greg McPherson, Rich Puyat, Wayne Zipper, Rowan Roundtree were really some of the leaders in, in trying to think about this. And, and those types of services and benefits, I'm going to be very particular about this idea, services and benefits um, that we're pretty close there. I mean, I mean, I think that we have the science well enough worked out for the purposes of policy and, and planning. And, and we need to get better at understanding these services and benefits for the purposes of regulatory compliance, as is being described in the idea of quantification. But we're, we're doing really well on this. And, and those topics are familiar to you, air quality, water quantity and quality, uh, benefits, property values. There are some social things that can be put into equations, Dave, like uh, cr physical values, cr crime, and uh, property values, crime, and physical activity. And, and Dave's talked about this. iTree is really the, one of the preeminent tools for us to start to think about this. So well, the science is getting there. The tools are getting there for us to think about benefits and services. When we start to think about the practice, uh, one of the great things that, that comes out of iTree is, is this idea of the quantification of the services and benefits has led to tree planting goals. And, and, and I, no matter how big or small your city has been, um, the, the proclamation is always we're going to have a one million tree plan, right? And it, never 500,000, 775, you know, or someone's going to go uh, after New York City and say, no, we're going 2 million. We're going to make it awesome. Uh, everyone just goes with 1 million. And then the question comes up, well, where are you going to put all these trees? And, and it's, I, I had this bizarre instance where I was out skiing um, one day, and I'm on, I'm on the ski lift, and there was this ski club from New York City. And I'm, like, talking to this lady, and she goes, what are you doing? I said, I work for the Forest Service. She goes, that Forest Service, can you believe they think that you can plant a million trees in New York City? And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did that report. <laughs> she goes, there's no way. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. So we, we got to this point where, you know, I was like, how bizarre was that? And there was this other person who was sitting in between us. It was like, okay, awkward. Where do I get off here? Um, what's that? Uh, I told her she was wrong. She was from, from Manhattan, so I felt like it was okay to go full guns on her. I would have been nicer to her if she was, like, from the Bronx. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we, we've, the next step for us to think about things is, is this whole issue of do we have enough space to plant these trees and where are these trees going to be planted? Um, so Jarlath has talked about this idea of existing and available. What I'd like to talk now about is prioritization, where we think about how do, can we increase services and benefits on all lands. And this all lands piece ends up being a really important question. Here's an image of, of this advance that we have in terms of the assessments. And then here is the really bad news for cities. Because what, when we have done these assessments, every city has said, can I get to increasing a million trees by street trees alone? And the answer is, no freaking way. There is, there is not enough room in all of your public rights of way and all of your parks to get to that one million trees. Not sure it's even a good idea, but you, you can't do it. It's all of this, um, it's all this other land that's in the city 
where, where you have these opportunities to plant trees. And most of it is residential areas. And so in terms of, for example, in the case of Philadelphia, 67% of all of, the, all of the opportunity for planting trees is on private residential areas. And the Forest Service thinks about forest landowners and that we need to serve forest landowners. So here's the bad news for the Forest Service is, in the case of Philadelphia, you have 460,000 forest landowners. That's a lot of people. And we have to think about how would you structure programs to, to start to work with all those forest landowners. I'm going to bet that in the city of Philadelphia, the number of private forest landowners is more than all of the rural area of Pennsylvania. Okay? So, and we have several cities in the state of Pennsylvania. So when we think about sort of a new agenda for the forest services, how are we going to start to work with what I would call the new forest landowner, which is all of these private urban landowners? And what are we going to do to motivate and to work with them, private landowners, to produce public benefit, which is all of those benefits and services that Dave has been talking about? This is going to be a huge challenge, and it's going to be a big question about property rights. And, and a nightmare for us is could be, now that we're assigning values to all these things, what happens when those private landowners might say, hey, I'd like to be paid for that? Right? OK, so that's the good news. No. Um, it, I mean, this is a real challenge for us in terms of thinking about um, how to start to go forward. What I'd like to do now is to um, give you some of the basic ideas of urban tree canopy prioritization, how we've been trying to move forward in the city of Baltimore. First, I'll start with a premise, a set of premises. First, that there's insufficient funds for one organization to achieve and maintain a significant urban tree canopy goal. We need tools to identify opportunities for coordination and collaboration get all these folks working together to, to try to achieve a goal. Coordination collaboration will require understanding what exists and what is missing in terms of the types of organizations that we have involved, what are the preferences, what are the categories and areas of interest, and how these organizations are linked and where they work. And what I'd like to do is to start to go through this now and show you how we've tried to do this. In terms of the three P's of prioritization, we, we first think about uh, what is possible. Where is it biophysically feasible to plant trees? And Jarl has been talking about that in terms of what exists and what's possible. Where, where could you have trees? Then we talk about what's preferable. And this is trying to get into some of the social drivers about uh, where would we like to have trees and why. And then what is potential? What, where is it uh, economically likely to plant trees? And, and I would argue that. Um, the, the regulatory requirements are one of the huge doors opening up that makes, makes it most likely to where you're going to plant trees, because that's where the money is. It's regulatory compliance that will drive a lot of where we have our tree planting. OK, so what, where we started with, with the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks, who has a very small budget. And by the way, we color this purple. When we do these things for different cities, we always use their football team in coloring. And, and by the way, we won the Super Bowl. OK, just putting that out there. So what we did was, with the Department of Recreation and Parks, who does, has very little money, uh, we said, how can we try to get the other city agencies to start to buy into advancing, achieving Baltimore City's urban tree canopy goal? And, and we asked a simple question, two simple, three simple questions. Okay. Three simple questions. Sorry, Dave, I can do three at least. So we get to, we get to, um, the first question was, do you have a program or a regulatory requirement that involves planting trees? And we went to every city agency. Then we said, what would be the variable that you would use in order to, to, to identify where to plant trees tied to that program or regulation? And then third, we said, will you give us that variable? <laughs> will you give us that piece of data? And it was astounding to us that, that we had all these different agencies saying, yeah, we, we actually have a reason for planting trees, whether it's Department of Transportation, whether it's uh, um, general services, whether it was public health, or so on, and, and that they overlapped. And so all of a sudden, we're, you know, there were these silos of city agencies that never talked to each other, that they actually were talking all to each other about how to advance tree planting. And we were connecting it to what motivated them to plant trees. And so we started to get a lot of buy-in in this case. Uh, they provide the data for us. And what we're able to do, and we've developed these sets of tools where we can do prioritization uh, in your city is to, to work with that, that list that we had developed and, and the kinds of data. And we have the tools where we can start to look at how to prioritize where to plant trees. And we have this so it can go back into your information system 
for, for your city because it needs to be operational in this sense to be able to prioritize at a neighborhood level as Dave and Jarlath have talked about and, and Laura's talked about those different geographies um, as well as down to the to the individual parcel where we would be able to assign for any individual parcel what their priority what the priority of increasing tree canopy could be there now we also think of it not only in terms of those criteria which I showed in that table we, but we also think about it in terms of categories of forestry that you could do and the reason for this is because different organizations have different categories in terms of where they might work uh, the, the, the government agencies don't work on residential land um, so, so that may not be a category that they work on but they may be very interested in those coastal areas that come under the coastal zone management uh, requirements or they may have large parks so we have what we call the forest opportunity spectrum which is those kinds of categories where forestry might might work and then we have the different sort of areas of interest so you might be focused only on on a neighborhood as a type of area or you might be focused on watersheds and and the reason that we're, we're we have this idea of criteria of of categories and areas of interest is because th this is how the different stakeholder groups kind of think about things in, in some very coarse kinds of ways. They think about, okay, I'm focused on water or I'm focused on um, community development. I only work in my one neighborhood and I only work on residential land. So we need to be able to start to understand and, and see how we can bring these kinds of groups together in order to build that coordination and collaboration. So here's what the results are when we, we brought together uh, 30 different uh, stakeholder groups in the city of Baltimore. Uh, showing what the what was uh, most voted for and what you see is that um, people rate uh, impervious surface as one of the highest priorities for where to start to plant trees because so many of the groups are motivated by trying to address stormwater you also see that the urban heat island which has been discussed a lot is something that came up as something that was really important importantly also was uh, potential stewardship where did we have groups that were actually working on uh, taking care of forest resources as a, as a third priority area. Now, this gives you a broad overview of when we get all of our different stakeholders in the city of Baltimore together, what, what would be their priorities that they might have. But we can also use, um, because we did a survey uh, process with, with all these groups together in a meeting, we can also start to see uh, which groups have the most affinity with each other. And, and we break it out and are able to see that we have private sector uh, public agencies and nonprofits that may have um, some similarities in, in how they want to work together. And, and why we want to do this is because we want to have an active conversation with all these groups about what are the kind of coalitions that we can build. Is there redundancy, duplication of effort, but also where are there gaps in terms of how they would like to work together. So this is showing uh, how it breaks out in terms of the similarities, in terms of the preferences of what they would like to do. We're also able to map it out in terms of where would they like to, to focus on working. For every single group, they, they filled out their rating system in terms of what they would like to do, and we were able to provide them with their own map in terms of where they would be, where their priorities would be in terms of where they would like to work. And they're able to talk to each other about, oh, we share similar priorities, um, or we actually may have very different priorities, but we still want to work in the same place. All of this work is place-based, so we always need to be able to map this out in terms of a specific location. We're able to generate that summary map, and we're able to help uh, each of the different organizations look at where they want to work and compare it to what emerged, at least as a consensus, by putting all the different groups together. So we're, we're working to, be, to look at in terms of the affinities in, in terms of that cluster diagram, but we're also able to resolve it and look at Here's, what it, here's what's coming out of all of our, our coalition of uh, urban forestry groups in terms of what their priorities would be. We can look in terms of the categories, and, and one of the key points, as I noted to you, is that historically we've been very focused on street trees, and you see that reflected here, where most of the groups are, are focusing on, on, on street trees. And I, and I made the point that residential areas are really actually where we need to start to focus. And, and many fewer groups are working on residential areas. And I would argue that private industrial is also a very important area that we start to work too. And those are some of the categories that we're working on least. Here again, we're able to, to look at the clustering. And again, we see that there's, there's affinities among different nonprofits and private groups in terms of, of working together. Uh, and where you see 
uh, certain groups like DPW, which has a lot at stake in terms of stormwater, and, and their uh, closest affiliate is an engineering firm that does all sorts of work on stormwater, right? Um, and you start to see these coalitions that, that, that start to emerge. And then we can reorder, we can start to look at how they filled out the categories where they work. And again, you see the, the dominance of street trees. And if we wanted to start to work on schools, we could see which groups are working on schools. We can also see who's handling abandoned lots. And the, and the point here is that there are all sorts of different kinds of categories that we need to work on. And we can see which groups are most likely to want to work with each other or if we want to work in a neighborhood and we know that we have, um, we, we've identified a neighborhood as a priority area and, and part of it has to be schools and part of it has to be private and part of it has to be industrial, we can start to see this as a sort of a roster from which to draw in terms of which stakeholders would be most appropriate for us to want to work in that one area. And then we can also think about the areas of interest. Um, we, they, all of our stakeholders filled out what were their areas of interest. And uh, you see that neighborhoods are, are a, we had a bunch of groups that only work in one certain neighborhood, and that's why this is so pop, popular. And then we had groups that work citywide. And we see um, how that starts to, to sort out. And, and one of the things that we've been having to deal with is that we have certain nonprofits that are highly redundant in terms of, uh, in terms of the, their, their activities. And, and those are our Parks and People Foundation, Blue Water Baltimore, and, and there's been conversations about the, how they need to kind of sort out what they're doing. Now, uh, recognizing this in terms of their areas of interest, we can also go back and see that they, they have very different kinds of, of focus in terms of Blue Water Baltimore, which uh, tends to work in parks and schools, and then Parks and People, which uh, works across uh, abandoned lots and street trees and, and has a more diverse sort of portfolio. So my point here is being able to link through, and it's sort of kind of a relational database way of thinking about combining categories of interest with the areas of interest and their preferences helps us to understand how we actually might get to that one million trees combination in order to achieve this goal. Now, we, we also need to understand how they, they connect together and, and actually talk to each other. And this is work that Michelle uh, did in Baltimore and Seattle, and it's something that Ann Bartuska talked about uh, yesterday, which is stewardship mapping and being able to understand how these organizations are also exchanging information, how they exchange staff, and how they exchange resources. Because we want to really understand this network or ecosystem of collaboration or potential for collaboration coordination in order for us to get to that one million tree goal. One of the key things that's been done is to, to have these networks, but also to be able to map them. And that's kind of a recurring theme that you would hear from me is how, how can we actually map this out in space where these things are occurring. This is an example from New York City where you can click on any one place where an organization is working and you can see what other organizations they're connected to and where those other organizations are working as well. So again, the, the point is how do we build coalitions in order to co coordinate and collaborate on trying to achieve this goal and to achieve the, the programmatic and the regulatory requirements that the city has. Okay, so that, that's one big area where I think that we need to go. And, and a fundamental piece to it is how do we work with the residential landowners. The other big area where I think we need to go is start to add to the conversation. Dave hinted at in his presentation, we have the, we have the benefits and services. The next big step is to think about what are the goods that are going to come out? Now, we work with the Forest Products Lab and the Forest Products Lab for the Forest Service. And the Forest Products Lab makes the point that there's more urban wood biomass, more woody biomass coming out of urban areas than all of the national forests combined. Now, our friends in the national forest would say that just means that we don't have enough harvesting in the national forest. But uh, regardless, we, we just know that that's a lot of wood. Okay? It's a lot of wood, and most of it's going into landfills. Right? So, that's not a good idea. And, and what we're working on, and, and there's a project that we have called the Baltimore Wood Project, is to start to think through that whole process of what, of what would it look like if we start to try to maximize all of the wood that, that's coming out of urban areas on both public and private land. And so we, we have this neat little diagram that talks about how do we inventory uh, all, of that, all of that woody biomass, and, and could it go for logs to, for, for structures, for, for buildings, 
Um, could it go for cabinetry? Could it go for bioenergy? Could it go for wood chips? Could it go for composting? We need to be able to look at any one tree and say, this is how it can be where all the parts would go, right? But we also then have to think about, okay, once we bring down these trees and work with Asplen and, and Bartlett and all the folks, Davey, who save a tree, who are bringing down the trees, how do you actually cut up the tree? in order to, to do that, and that requires some training. Then where does all that wood go? Where are the sorting yards that it goes? And then where are the markets that it goes? What's the job training that's required? Um, how can it be used? We're working on a project on carbon neutral row homes in Baltimore, so can we use it for doing buildings? And then, and then how can we complete the circle in terms of learning and, and to educate it? Now, this is, it, it's hard to do this in a linear way because it's sort of not hard to know what the inventory should be until you have what you know what the markets are. Right? So this is, this, this is a challenging project, but it's one that we think for the, we're going to be working on for the next 10 years to start to think about how can we look at the management of the urban forest in a productive way for maximizing goods and to build markets, to build jobs, right? And, and to help to bring back the revenue in terms of the management of that urban forest. So the, I guess my point here is to say this is the other big piece that I think we're going to be chasing after for the next 10 years in terms of where are we going in terms of urban forestry. So in conclusion, uh, I think that the next major phase in urban forestry will be a fundamental shift in focus from where we had been, where we have been thinking principally about street trees, and our major science domains were urban forestry and arboriculture, and our practice was on street tree programs and park management. We focused on street trees and parks, uh, the ownership was public and the types of land use were those rights of ways and, and institutional properties to a focus on trying to advance sustainability where the science is really the urban ecology of cities and sustainability science. So it's a, it's a much different kind of science program. We still need what we had, but we, we, we need to reach out and it's going to be a much broader science agenda and we're going to be thinking about an all lands and all people approach. Okay, and we're going to be trying to advance urban sustainability goals that are social, that are economic, and that are environmental all brought together. We're going to be looking at public, private, community, and, and vacant, frankly, abandoned land. Many of our cities have this abandoned land. And we'll be thinking about residential, industrial, commercial, and institutional properties. And we're going to be thinking about the services, benefits, and importantly, the goods that we're going to need in order to really uh, advance the sustainability of, of cities in the country. Thank you.